Nita, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for making time for this. Uh, I've Thank been you so much for having me. Yeah, uh, I've been aware of who you were for quite a while now, but I'm not really sure like of your come up or like how did you get here? Was there like one big breakthrough or yeah, tell me about that? Yeah, I think the there's a very common misconception across our industry that, you know, making it happens in one big step where you're like, you're nobody, you're nobody, and then something happens and then you have success. Um, for me, and I think for most others in my position, it's more like pushing a very heavy boulder up a very steep hill. <laughs> And every once in a while, you get to for a very long time. You know, this is my my twenty first year on the road this year. I've been touring since I was fifteen. I'm thirty six now. So, you know, every once in a while, you, you get the boulder to a point where you're like, "Whew, I can rest." And then you look around, you're like, "All right, the top's up there. Here we go. We keep pushing the boulder up that hill." So, um, I think there were lots of milestones, of course, along the way that helped me out. You know, um, touring. You know, my my first tours as a teenager, you know, my first hired gun gig, you know, joining a band called the Iron Maidens, touring internationally a lot with them, uh, joining up with Alice Cooper in 2014, releasing my first solo record in 2018, um, having my first solo song actually go to radio and go to number one in 2021. Like there have been so many, um, you know, starting to work with the Rams in 2020, getting a Super Bowl ring from that. I mean, each thing just you know, propels the boulder further up the hill, so to speak. Well, I feel like in anybody's career in, you know, whether it's entertainment or anything else, I, I feel like there's oftentimes like one moment where you're like, okay, this might actually happen for me. Was there something like that for you? Honestly, um, and this, this might sound like an egotistical way of saying it, but it kind of didn't occur to me that it, it wouldn't work. You know, I, I just always had this mindset of like, it's going to happen no matter what it takes. I will outwork anybody. I will stay on the road, you know, more and more than anybody. I was only home 18 days last year, you know, oh in, in the entirety of 2022, I was only in my house 18 days um, because I went from, you know, my tour to the Alice tour to the Demi Lovato tour, you know, back out on my tour now. And uh, it's just, I think that's what it takes is that like stick intuitiveness <laughs> yeah. that's a word i mean what you've done is so like statistically it's so unlikely that that it would actually work out that i think you have to have that kind of belief in yourself or it's not going to happen yeah um i think mindset is extremely important i mean you're not going to get anywhere on mindset alone but if you don't have that mindset i think it makes it harder you know you listen to to uh interviews i was uh listening to an interview recently with conor mcgregor the mma fighter and he was saying he has an attitude of abundance. He's a, an attitude of gratitude that I already am the best. I already have all the things in my life that I want, you know. And they had they showed an old interview of him winning his first UFC fight where he said, I spent my last money in my bank account to buy this nice tie to wear to the presser today because, I, you know, I know I'm going to win. I, don't, I know people are going to see me talk today. And uh, I think that's that's the attitude to have. Just, you know, push forward with the idea that you're not going to fail, there will be setbacks. You know, we're having setbacks every tour on this tour, you know, th that I'm on right now, we've probably had the most setbacks of any tour since maybe the early days of being in a van. So, uh, you know, the important thing is just keep on, keep on going, keep moving forward. And really quickly, I also wanted to mention my Patreon. If you like what I do on YouTube and everywhere else, joining my Patreon really helps me do this full time and worry less about videos getting demonetized by YouTube or copyright claimed by labels. Patrons get all my podcasts and main channel videos early. There are members only channels in my Discord that I'm super active in. I also do giveaways. For example, I've been giving away a lot of Emo's Not Dead merch. And you can also have me review your music, artwork, or anything else. All you need to do is join my Patreon at the $10 level. And then every month I do a call for submissions. If you want me to review something, just drop it in the comments of that post. And then I will review it live on Twitch. So if any of that sounds cool to you, hit the link in the description of this video. And I appreciate your support. But you said something else that I think is really important is that you can't make it on mindset alone. Because I mean, I think we all know people who have that kind of like self you know, belief, but you're like, dude, this is, you are not good. Um, <laughs> how <laughs> yeah. do you kind of, how do you kind of balance that, you know, realistic assessment of where you're at with also believing in yourself? 
there's a saying, another saying, you know, I, I'm, I'm giving you a lot of platitudes today, but there's a saying that I like, which is hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard. Love that one. And there's a lot of people that are very talented that have big dreams. Um, but if you're not willing to, you know, do the numbers, you know, crunch the numbers, figure out how much merch to order, figure out how to logistically do your VIPs, you Practice know, your can instrument. you afford to tour in a bus, a bandwagon or a van? practice you know but like that's that's the fun part playing guitar is the easy part like you but know a lot of people a lot of guitarists don't was, practice you know that's true and uh and it shows <laughs> <I'm just kidding. laughs> um but just in terms of like logistically what it takes you know the the hard work doesn't stop at the instrument the hard work you know extends on to like all these other aspects of the business of what we do yeah well, one thing, I mean, I guess speaking of, of all that, one thing I'm just like amazed by with you is looking at all the things that you're involved with. And I mean, like you said, being home 18 days out of the year, like I looked over the pitch deck that, you know, your your publicist sent over and I was like exhausted just looking at it. Um, I get exhausted and, when people ask me about it. <laughs> like, do I really do all that? <laughs> right. Well, one thing that I think you've been able to do that's really tough is to have success and be taken seriously as a solo artist while also playing with other people like you know you mentioned alice and demi and you know the other things you've done usually you kind of have to choose between being an artist or being you know a side person and you've been able to do both what do you think has been the key to that not taking breaks uh-huh <laughs> is really the key honestly um and also, I mean, you know, we sort of we schedule my solo music around my my day job, my you know my my working gigs, and really just being willing to say like, hey, I have six weeks between tours this year. Like, I could spend six weeks at home, you know, recharging and resting, getting ready for the album release, which is in July, or I could spend this this month on the road, you know, promoting the record and you know grinding it out out, out here on the club tour with my solo band. And I will take that any day of the week. I don't need six weeks off. Like, I love my team out here. I love playing these songs. The record's not even out yet. You know, technically, we shouldn't even probably be doing this tour until after the record is out and we can have it at the merch table to sell it and support it. But if I, this is the time that I have and I'm not going to waste it, you know, I'd rather spend it out here doing it. Yeah, I, I, I like, I mean, it sounds like what the common thread between a lot of what you've talked about is just working insanely hard and... A lot of people it feels like they talk about work-life balance and it's like if you want to do something extraordinary with your life that's not going to exist it's true i think there are different seasons of your life where you have a different level of balance um and right now where i'm at in my life uh there's there's not a lot of room for work-life balance and i've accepted that <laughs> i'm okay mm -hmm. with it i don't need a couple hours to sit and watch my netflix you know i've uh I've got my dogs here on the road with me. Oh. I've got my boyfriend on the road with me. You know, my boyfriend's my drummer and also my manager. Okay. And, you know, you find you find ways to make the balance tolerable. You know, at times like this, oh, my dog just put her head right in my hand. I was so cute. <laughs> um, Mommy, don't forget uh, about You find me. ways, you know, exactly. No, they, they know they're not going to get forgotten about. They're the most they're the most needy people on the tour, to be <laughs> honest with you. Um, but, you know, like someone like Alice who tours like crazy, you know, I take a lot of my cues from him. You know, he takes excellent care of his people, you know, makes make sure that his team around him, you know, wants to be there, is excited about putting the show on the road. You know, like I know that my band and crew that are out here with me, like we're in this fight together and we will all go to the mat to make the show happen every single day, no matter what the obstacles are. And as long as you have good people around you and you find ways, you know, little ways like having the dogs around, you know, to make it uh, a little less insane feeling. Um, I think it's, I think it's good when you're focused on something, when you have a singular goal to not worry too, too much about work-life balance, yeah. you know, not permanently, but for right. that period of time. Yeah. Well, I guess the, the particular thing I'm curious about is sort of the credibility thing of like, it almost feels like in the eyes of, some people, probably other guitarists, because fans probably don't care. But it, it, it feels like there's sort of this idea that if you play as a side person, take those kind of gigs, then it makes you less credible as a solo artist, which doesn't really make sense to me. But I, I feel like a lot of people kind of see it that way. I don't know. That hasn't been my experience. Um, when I put out my first solo record in 2018, uh, I think people were more surprised to actually 
hear what I sounded like as a guitar player because, you know, you hear me play Iron Maiden songs or you hear me play Alice Cooper songs or you hear me play Demi Lovato songs or, you know, play some solos over hip hop beats at Rams games. <clears throat> and those are all, it's almost like playing a character, a good right. hired gun steps into the role of whatever the gig is and fits seamlessly into that role. So, mm -hmm. oh, oh, my dog is snorting at me. Um, if you, if you are doing your job right, you're going to sound good in any circumstance. You're not going to sound like you're overplaying or like you, your style doesn't fit the bill or whatever it is. And so then when you hear that artist's solo music, you're like, oh, this is this doesn't sound like the Alice Cooper mm -hmm. songs that I'm used to hearing, or this doesn't sound like that. And that's that's sort of the chance for the side artist to be the artist, to be the principal artist. And it's uh, the main reason why I didn't have a producer or engineer on my first album, because I was so hell bent on nobody telling me what to do and how to do it. I was like, this is my vision. I don't know how to engineer really, but like, I'm going to figure it out. I watched a lot of YouTube videos on, you know, miking drums and recording drums. Oh, you and, recorded that stuff yourself? You know, I recorded everything on the oh, record man. myself. Yes. That's I mean, amazing. I didn't play the drums, you know, yeah. I had, you know, my boyfriend played the drums, my best friend, Kat, uh, played the keyboards. They're both on tour with me here now, which is really cool. Um, but yeah, I recorded and engineered everything myself. And you know, to be honest with you, it shows, you know, when you listen to the first record and you listen it doesn't to sound the songs, bad. you know, no, it doesn't sound bad. I'm, I'm very proud of it. I'm very, very proud of how it came out. But, uh, and you know, it's, a, it's a learning experience like anything, you know, and I, I just, I didn't want anybody telling me how to do it. I didn't want anybody's input. I didn't want a producer telling me that I could play mm -hmm. something better, you know, because I had spent my whole career having people tell me how they want things played. And uh, so that was, that's why I did the first one that way. But probably a big part of the reason why you were able to do that is because you had spent so many years, like you knew what the bar was because you had spent so long having people hold you to that standard. You're like, I, I get it. I know what this needs Absolutely. to be. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I think so. But, you know, the the real crux of the matter, I think, is as much as every, you know, some people, myself included, like to think that they're like a one person army. No person is really, you know, it, it takes a village to to put a tour on and make a record and all these kind of things. And, you know, the reality of it is if you play the same phrase 50 times and then you listen back to the takes, like your ears are so fatigued. You don't know which yeah. one was the best one. You know, you're not even focusing on that. You're like, I think number 60, you know, like, you know, <laughs> right. 45 sounded good, but then I did 15 more after that was one of those better, you right. know? Um, so on the second record, having like a bit more of a, a mature standpoint, you know, working with, you know, different, different engineers and producers and outside writers and guest vocalists. We have, you know, a ton of guests on this upcoming record that was, uh, I think, it made it overall a more complete sounding album, you know, because we had an engineer that actually knew how to engineer things <laughs> instead of uh -huh. me watching YouTube videos. That's pretty amazing, though, that you did that first album, you know, yourself, like without having a background. I mean, that's that's no joke. Um, one of the things I thought was really interesting about the um, your newest songs is that it's very like song driven. I mean, it's definitely guitar focused, obviously, but you know, you could get into that stuff even if you're just a metal fan that doesn't necessarily care about guitar per se compared to, you know, your older stuff that was very like, you know, shreddy. What made you kind of take that direction? I felt like we needed the follow up to the first record to be something different, something that can hook new listeners in and bring them into what I do. And as much as I would like to think that guitar music is the end all be all, you know, the, the greatest form of music there is, you know, the reality is it's, it's just not as viable commercially, you know, like you're not going to get a lot of non guitar players going and seeking it out. So right. you have to get a hook to get people in the door somehow. And uh, working with the incredible vocalists that I had a chance to work with, you know, Lizzie Hale, David Draymond, Anders Frieden from In Flames, Dorothy, Lilith Sarr, Chris Motionless, my boss, Alice Cooper, I mean, these are people that fans have familiarity with, that I happen to have familiarity with as well, that we can craft something really, really cool together and make songs that I'm really proud of. And then when people get the album that has them on it, they'll also hear the instrumental songs that, you know, are my heart and soul, mm -hmm. my bread and butter. And, you know, hopefully they will like what they hear there as well. I mean, it's quite, kind of a cool creative challenge too, right? Of like, how do you you know, write an accessible song, but still put in some, you know, flashy guitar stuff in there too, as opposed to having, you know, I mean, it's cool to just do all shred, but seems like that'd be a fun creative challenge too. 
Very much so. Yeah, it really was um, very challenging because I am a more is more type of player. And, uh, you know, in crafting these newer songs, it was really hard to have restraints and, you know, let the song breathe more and not add, you know, arpeggios and, you know, sweeps right. and tapping and melodies over every single part of the song. Maybe the verse just needs to be drums and vocals, you know, that is that was not an approach that was in my wheelhouse. So <laughs> uh, definitely, definitely learned a lot, grew a lot as an artist. Um, it served me very well moving into the Demi gig um, and really having already that sense of like how to not overplay as much. Mm -hmm. So uh, a good learning experience overall. So how did you write that stuff? Was it like you write a song and then tell the vocalist, do your thing here? Did you start with vocals or how do, how do those songs come together for the ones that do have vocals? It was a little of each. Um, so some of them, um, like Dead Inside, for example, was a complete David Draymond vocal. I take no credit for it. Uh, we sent him an instrumental song to sort of vibe to. And after a few days, he was like, I have it. I know what it's going to be. And he sent us back like a cell phone video of him singing almost exactly what ended up on the final record. Wow. Um, and then other songs, we crafted the vocal parts in the studio and, you know, really wrote the song to serve that vocal part. Um, I was trying to think of a good example. The the Lizzie Hale song, which is not out yet, Through the Noise, is a good example of that. We wrote that one with uh, an amazing songwriter named Johnny Andrews, who has worked with Lizzie, worked with Motionless, worked with Three Days Grace and a ton of bands. And I liked working with people like that on this record because, you know, the reality is there was a lot of things I didn't know how to do on my first record. And this one, this time around, I wanted to make sure that I was doing everything well and doing it right. If I'm going to write songs for singers to sing, I want to write them some good songs. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, sitting down with somebody like Johnny Andrews and saying like, what's your process? How do you do it? And like understanding his process and how we can create this track, like very catchy, very straightforward, mainstream rock track with a bunch of Nita embellishment added in. And then send it off to someone like Lizzie who puts her spin on it. It just makes it the icing on the cake. Well, it's interesting you say that because I feel like, um, you know, that idea of restraint is something that I guess a lot of younger musicians, they just don't want to hear it. Yeah, it's true. It's not fun. <laughs> <laughs> But at the end of the day, you come out with something where you're like, okay, now I understand why the older people told me that sometimes I should chill out. You know, it's really true. It, it honestly, it is true. I don't think there's a wrong way to do it. You know, there's not a wrong way to make art, um, not a wrong way to create. But um, I think that if you listen, and I even hear it, you know, in the live set now, I'm playing a lot of my older songs and a lot of the new songs from the upcoming record. And I even hear it in, you know, in my in-ears when we're playing the songs on the stage. I'm like, God, damn, there's a lot of stuff going on in those right, old songs. Right. There's like so many guitar harmonies and so much things. And like, you know, you sort of have this option of like, do you put a guitar harmony on your backing track or do you do it, you know, leave the leave all guitars out and then have it sound yeah. half empty, you know, like, and there's like, you know, obviously I would never put a main guitar line on the track, yeah. but like, do I harmonize to myself and let my rhythm guitar player play the chords or do I put the you know, the backing chords on there and have him play yeah. the lead line with me. And like, these songs are just so complex. There's, you know, six different guitars going on at one time. And if you leave four of them out, they don't sound right. You know, right. so it's, it's interesting hearing, you know, playing these songs back to back and hearing the growth in just the arrangements, you know, not even the songwriting, but just the arrangements of the layering of parts, how different it was, you know, five years ago to now. You know, one of the things I thought was like, super cool about Pantera is that sometimes, you know, cause they were, they were a one guitar band and in a lot of songs like walk, you know, during the solo, the rhythm guitars drop out. And, uh, yeah. I mean, that's so rare, but like it, it makes the solo seem that much more special. Oh, absolutely. There's, there is something so powerful about the rhythm guitar dropping out and just soloing over the bass. I mean, that's, that's a ballsy move. It I, is I nothing to hide behind doing it. And, you know, my, my boyfriend watches a lot of Pantera live videos. Like, you know, he's a drummer and, you know, he's his sort of like morning wake up process. He likes, he likes to wake up and have an energy drink and watch YouTube, you know, concert footage. Sure. And he's been watching a lot of Pantera. We're doing a Pantera song on this tour and uh, just watching the sheer consistency of that band. I mm -hmm. mean, especially for a band that's sort of known for being hard partying, you know, fast lifestyle kind of guys 
you know, you would never think it by how unbelievably tight they were. At, yeah. You know, I have now heard a lot of live Pantera because that's how Josh likes to wake up. So uh, it, it's just wild hearing just, as you said, just the guitar, bass and drums on that solo and hearing how incredible it sounded. I mean, it never played a bad show. You can't find it. It doesn't exist. Yeah, I have I have not heard. I mean, like rarely even an off note, you know, right. like a like a sour note where you're like, ooh, you know, that that didn't sound quite right. It's just uh, unbelievable, unbelievable. What a fantastic band! Yeah, well, you talked about writing with some of these songwriters, and that's another thing that a lot of musicians are kind of hesitant to do, which I don't really understand because I mean, songwriting is a is its own craft that's different from playing. They're two separate yeah. things. Um, talk about why you, why, why did you decide to bring in some of the songwriters and was there a, a part of that that was like hard for you to swallow or how do you think about that? Oh, I was dragged into it kicking and screaming. I like, I, I will admit, I'll admit when I'm wrong. Uh, I was totally wrong. Um, but I absolutely did not want to do it. I, I, you know, and again, I think a lot, a big part of that comes from being someone else's guitar player for a long time. You just think like, this is my art. This is my thing. Yeah. I don't want anybody telling me how to do it. People to tell me how to play Alice Cooper songs. People tell me how to play Demi Lovato songs. Like when I make Nita Strauss music, I only want me being the one to do it. But the reality is like, if I knew how to write a number one song, I would have done it on my own. <laughs> right. You know, like and it's fucking I, and hard. It's fucking hard. Like, <laughs> like if it, if it was just something you could like snap your fingers and do. And, you know, there wasn't a situation where I was like, you know, hey, just give me a song and like, that'll be my song. Like yeah. I was there in the room in the trenches, you know, creating this stuff, you know, writing these meaningful pieces of music, you know. Um, and before I went into it, I was worried that someone was just going to be like, like, you know, hey, here's this catalog of songs. Just pick one, you know, right. and, and that wasn't my experience at all. Everybody that we worked with was like, you know, what do you want to write about? What do you want to say? What type of vocalist do you have in mind? You know. There wasn't necessarily a, you know, we want to write this song for Lizzie Hale. It was like, we need a female powerhouse vocalist. You mm -hmm. know, we listened to some Hailstorm, we listened to some Dorothy, we listened to, you know, Lilith Starr and Pretty Reckless and like those kind of vocalists. And like, okay, this is the type of cadence. This is the type of arrangement. This is the kind of tempo. And we sort of wrote towards that and then wound up with the right singer after the fact. So you were almost, you were almost like the producer really in that situation. Um. You know, I was I was like the producer uh, in training, let's say. Yeah. But I mean, you're, um, you're calling the shots at the end of the day because your name is on the record. Yes, yes. I there wasn't a there wasn't a situation where I felt steamrolled and like I didn't like what was going on. You know, maybe maybe the first day or two where I was still you know understanding what you know historically I have not played well with others when it came to my own music which is a big uh -huh. part of why i became a solo artist instead of starting a band like i really just i just want to do my own thing right. and so the first few days uh of working with you know an outside writer who actually was johnny andrews um and it was the the two songs we did those first two days were uh through the noise which is the lizzie hale track and digital bullets which is the chris motionless track so two of the, the biggest songs on the record and uh the first couple of days, I was like, I don't know if I like this, you know, here I am having my ideas and I'm getting some pushback. And I'm like, what if we add this here? It's like, I don't, I think that's going to step on the vocal. And I was like, well, right. what do you mean it's going to step on the vocal? That's what I do, you know, and, <laughs> right. that's what uh, we're here for. you know, that's what we're here for. This is a shreddy shreddy project, you know, and um, the way the songs came out are exactly as they should be. And if I had done it by myself, it like simply would not have come out as well as it did. And I, I'm, uh, a big enough woman to admit that, uh, you know, I don't know everything about everything. And the songs were much better served by working with some people who could help me. You know, I was driving the car, but they were working the navigation system and telling me, you know, this is a good way to go to get to where you want to go. I mean, that's such a difficult, like, internal battle to fight, though. You know, like we were talking about before is like, how do you know when to trust your instincts and how do you know when to let go of the wheel? It's really hard. <laughs> Yeah, it is. And I think it's it's like that, whether you're talking about songwriting or whether you're talking about touring, you know, like if you're in my position, you're, you're working with different artists and, you know, situations like that. And uh, I think that your instincts, you know, will usually lead you to where you want to go. Um, one of my favorite In Flames lines that like when I was in high school, I wanted to get this tattoo is follow your instincts. They'll usually take you home, you know, and uh I, I just have always sort of gone with my gut, follow my heart, mm -hmm. you know, and I, I think it's, I think it's led me in the right place so far. 
But I don't know if that works for everybody because there's a lot of people who have been listening to their instincts and following their gut for a while and things are not working out for them. And maybe for those people, they need to yeah, trust their instincts what? a little yeah. less. You know, I, I should really add a caveat to that because it is a romantic thing to say. But, you know, as I just admitted to you, I didn't even want to work with these outside writers. And clearly my instinct was wrong. So let me add a caveat to what I just said, which is not only do you need to trust your instincts, but also if you're at this level where you're making these big kind of decisions, you have to have a good team. Like you yeah. have to have the right people around you. Um, my my lawyer, Eric German, has oh, been I know Eric. Yeah, he's great. by my side. I know you, you've had him on the show, I believe, mm -hmm. right? Um, he has literally been by my side since I was 25 or six, you know, like more than 10 years. He's sort of like had his hand, like, I feel like I'm the training driver and he's got like the training steering wheel on the other side. Like, okay, you're going to make the left here. You know? And he's like, one of those people that's truly in your corner uh, that he says, you know, Nita, you should do this. Then you go, all right, if you say I should yes. do this, I'm going to do it. Eric was actually the first person to ever say you should get features on these songs. Like, you know, instead of like having a situation where it's like, Hey, I'm going to make a record and I could, you know, have a singer on the whole thing. He's like, why don't you just do a bunch of different features? And uh, my boyfriend, Josh is the same way. He's been managing me uh, since 2015. He's really been the driving force between a lot of these interesting things that I get to do, you know, so he's a badass manager because you get a lot of really fucking cool opportunities. Oh, he's like, he's a rock star manager. Like he's, he's the best, you know, there are, there are things that he thinks of for me to do that other managers would be like, well, I don't know how to do that. You know, like right. when, uh, like the Rams thing, I, playing, I mean, that's very like the Rams thing. unconventional. Exactly. What other manager would think, you know, and he, the way that he thinks outside the box is really unique because he, he doesn't just put me in these situations where it's like, you know, well, how can we make money? You know, because at the end of the day, like, you know, we're a business partnership, but we're also, you know, life partners. Yeah. And so he's not going to put me in any situation that I would be uncomfortable in. So his whole approach is, what do you like? And I like football. <laughs> I like football and I like where I'm from, which is Los Angeles. So when my hometown got our team back, he was like, how can we connect you with this in some way? And uh, so, you know, he got in touch with someone at the Rams. They got me to play uh, at the Salute Service game. I played America the Beautiful and then he, you know, he was hammering them again the following season. Hey, Nita would love to come back. Is there, you know, any way that you see her fitting in? They're like, yeah, why don't you have her come down and play the Sunday Night Football theme, which is uh, basically just a Joan Jett song. So, you know, came back and did that. And he's like, we love working with you guys. Just sort of like keeping the communication open, keeping the relationship alive. And then when the team moved to SoFi, you know, they came to us and said, hey, you've been such a great fit. You guys are so good to work with. Why don't you come and do this at every game? And that's how I became the first guitar player for an NFL team. You know, like no other team has one. Right. And uh, and it's because Josh had this vision of like, why not you? Why mm -hmm. why shouldn't you be first? You know, and uh, that's the kind of thing I've had different managers in my life. And a lot of them just didn't know what to do with a yeah. solo guitar player, aside from like putting me in a band and letting me go on tour. And uh, it's that kind of thinking outside the box, I think, that really separates what we do from what anybody else is doing right now. I was wondering where these kind of things came from, because like you said, you know, it's very out of the box. And for anybody who doesn't know a manager, I mean, correct me if you think I'm, uh, if you would put it differently, but to me, a manager in the music business is kind of like a salesperson for you is sort of how I think about it. Um, yes, that's a great so they're way to go out it. there and hunt down, either create these opportunities and hunt them down. And some managers are not very creative and they're just like, oh, well, you know, go do the same stuff everyone else does. Yeah. And the things you do are so out of the box. I was wondering where those came from. And, and uh, man, hats off to him. Yeah, he's he's amazing at that stuff. Um, and he describes himself sometimes as a lawyer, which is funny because, you know, we obviously we have a lawyer, but. He basically says, I have to make, you know, this is what he says when other people, he doesn't manage a lot of other people. And mm -hmm. we know other guitar players have been like, hey, can you do what you did for Nita with me? He's like, well, I'm like her lawyer. I have to go in and I have to make my, my case and I have to have all the facts and evidence. And if he didn't have me with, with the good facts and evidence behind me, you know, with lots of stage touring experience and I can come in and, you know, play different styles of music and this and that, like whatever, whatever facts are needed to present the case, then it doesn't work. You know, right. you can't pull somebody off the street without the, with a different level of experience and have it work the same way. Hello. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you, could, you, you, you couldn't sell go me ahead, as the Rams guitarist. It's just not going to work. Yeah. 
yeah, it, it would be, it would be tough. You know, it's, <laughs> it's just about having the, um, having, having the, the resume to back it up, I guess. Yeah. Well, I, I wanted to talk to you about the, uh, Demi thing because I'm a huge fan of Demi and, uh, I don't know, I, I guess it's not really unexpected that you would end up playing with Demi, but it, it kind of, I don't know. It was a little bit unexpected for me. Um, it was unexpected for me too. <laughs> yeah. How did that happen? <laughs> So um, we were on the last day of um, my band was out on tour opening for Black Label Society, and uh, it was a tough tour. Um, we were unrelated to the whole Demi story, but we were we were on the last day of, of what was a very long, you know, few weeks. And I get a call from Demi's musical director, basically saying um, that Demi is trying. She has finished uh, a new record, which is a much harder edge style than what she's done before. And she wants to not only play these new songs live, but she wants to rework her older material to fit this new style, you know? And as we all know, like we've all heard it by now, Demi is a legit metalhead, like a yeah. hard rock fan. She listens to heavier shit than I do, which is crazy because I listen to some heavy shit. <laughs> like, you know, yeah, she turned it. me on to like some Florida death metal bands that I didn't know about. <laughs> yeah, I so. know. Like you, you, you posted, I think it was Angel Maker, like your Instagram story. And people Body were like, Snatcher, yeah. Oh, that's what it was. That's Body Snatcher. Yes. Yeah. And people were like freaking yeah. out about that. Yeah, exactly. It made news that Demi, you know, Demi was the one that sent me this Body Snatcher song. She's you legit. Know? She was talking about Job for a Cowboy 15 years ago. Oh, yeah. How she lost her shoes in a behemoth mosh pit or right. something like that. Like, yeah, she's um the the world knows now like she's hardcore yeah. you know and uh so it was really cool to get to be a part of creating the show with her and her team because it's not often in this industry that you get to see somebody really have this like rebirth and expression of self you know and uh she was so happy you know she was playing these songs and I imagine in a way that she'd always heard them, you know, mm -hmm. in her head, yeah. even if she was playing them in a more of a mainstream style before. And uh, she just sank her teeth right into the rock role. Um, she was a rock star every single night. You know, there were days on tour where she wasn't at her best, where she was feeling sick. And like, sure. you know, to her credit, we didn't cancel a single show. Or actually, I think I think there was one point where she completely lost her voice and couldn't talk. And we postponed a couple shows. But, you know, she powered through with grace and abandon that any any rock band would be proud of and it was it was just exciting to be a part of creating this new sound with her i mean she's such a fucking incredible vocalist too i've been a fan of hers for a really long time she is ridiculous and she does it she's least, unreal as far as i can tell like she's doing this with minimal backing tracks because you know you see like the jimmy fallon stuff and like you can tell it's not perfect which means it's real oh yeah, oh, yeah. you know there was uh there was one time when we were we were on tour in South America last year um and she was uh, sort of famously sick and where she said this this offhand comment that made the news saying this would be my last tour I don't want to tour anymore because she was she had the flu and we had an arena show that night and um there was some chatter backstage like is she going to use a backing track and she got there and said absolutely fucking not I have never done that and I will never do that. And like, you know, she got out on stage. She she didn't go for a lot of those high notes, her signature notes. She told the crowd right there in the crowd, right there in the moment. She said, hey, guys, you're going to have to help me sing today. Like and like and it was a rock show. Yeah, you know? exactly. And like I give her all the props in the world for that moment because it would have been the easiest thing in the world for her to snap her fingers and say, turn on the backing track. I want to sound perfect. And she went out there, no auto tune, no tricks, no backing mm -hmm. tracks and and crushed it like a pro. And uh I just have a ton of respect for her in, in so, so, so many ways. Uh, so how did she discover you? Was it through her director? Like, wh where was the actual connection there? I believe it was through, yeah, it was through her former guitar player, Max Bernstein. Okay. Um, Max and I are old pals from when I was touring with Jermaine Jackson. He was playing with Kesha. We were rehearsing next door to each other. We met each other then. Uh, just kind of stayed in touch. Uh He's a straight up like punk rock, rock and roll guy that is now firmly in the mainstream pop world. He plays guitar for Taylor Swift. He plays guitar for Miley Cyrus, like the A-list of the A-list. Uh, and he was Demi's guitar player for a while. And so when he found out that she was looking for an all-female band to craft this show with, he told their musical director, Stacey Jones, he's like, you've got to talk to Nita. So 
I'm I'm so excited that like when that's the goal that I'm the call, if that yeah. makes sense. Like how cool that I'm the like I'm the person people think of for that stuff. And uh yeah, so that's where the connect was. It seems like you guys are just having so much fun with those shows. Not to say that you don't with other shows, but you know, like you said, she's kind of reinvented herself, you know, almost even though she's like a giant pop star, it almost feels like you're seeing a club band or something, if that makes sense. Totally. It's very raw. It's very real. You know, another thing that I, I enjoyed about being on that tour is she doesn't plan out her, her stage banter. You know, she doesn't say the same thing every night <laughs> and, uh, you know, she will, you know, comment on people's signs in the crowd or, you know, talk about something about last time she was there in that city. Uh, and it just feels like a regular show, you, you know, I think a lot of us had this idea, you know, a lot of people had this idea, like when I went over to that camp, that it was going to be this very manufactured, very, right. you know, put together show. And uh, it really wasn't. There was not a lot of differences between that tour and any other tour I've done. It was it was straightforward rock and roll show every single night. Right. Well, I, I, I'm going to ask a question that I hate asking, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, okay. You mentioned sort of being the go-to person for this like all-female band, and and I really dislike the idea of like you know female fronted or fe like I I don't like that. However, the fact of the matter is, at least in my opinion, that metal guitar, at least the online version of it, is like ninety-nine percent nerdy males that tend to either not take women seriously as musicians or put them on a pedestal in a really weird way. But I feel like you've been kind of able to, have, at least to me, it seems like you've been able to avoid both of those things and just exist as a guitarist. How do you think about that? Um, I, I think more so than others, maybe. Uh, not entirely. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I think uh, a big part of it is um, I'm a guitar player's guitar player. I love what I do. I take what I do very seriously. You know, I do, I can do my own setups, you know, I, you know, I have a guitar tech on the road, but like, I'm a big dork with my gear. I'm a fan first and foremost, you know, when I get to have these experiences, like, you know, writing a song with Anders from it, like literally wearing an In Flames hoodie right now. In Flames is my favorite band. I got to write a song with him. <laughs> like, you know, right. I was in a, a club band growing up that played eighties, eighties covers and we played Poison by Alice Cooper. And now I get to play Poison with Alice Cooper. And uh, I think people resonate like to that because I I'm in I've been in the trenches doing what everybody's doing. I'm still a fan and I get to live out this this dream. And like while there will still be people on both sides of the spectrum, um, you know, either just not wanting to get behind a female guitar player or, you know, putting you on a, a pedestal in, you know, in a different weird way. Yeah. I think that by and large, like my my group of people kind of stick straight down the middle of mm -hmm. like we just kind of get where each other's at. Yeah, I don't really ever, I mean, again, I'm sure it happens, but I, I don't ever hear people talking about you really as anything other than just a guitarist, which is how it should be for everybody. I agree. I, I do agree, and I appreciate that. Um, but at the end of the day, though, also, there are just so many more important things to, to you know, get worked up about. You know, somebody calls me, uh, you know, female guitar player, anything, you yeah. know, you're on the list of, you know, best female guitarists of the 2010s or, or whatever it is, like, it just, it really doesn't bother me anymore. And they like, mean maybe well, when I was younger, of the time. I am a female guitar player. <laughs> right, <laughs> you know, right. like, what right. do you want me to say? Like, you know, I, I could be on a list of best blonde guitar players. I could be sure. on a list of best guitar players from Los Angeles. Like, you know, uh, I That's don't true. really mind the distinction. You know, if, if it was something inaccurate, I guess I would be more offended. But like, it doesn't bother me. I'm happy to be in the conversation. But the, it, it did get under your skin when you were younger? Definitely. Yeah. You know, I think, you know, as a teenager, you know growing up and when it was a lot less common you know there weren't as many girls doing doing it as are doing it now uh it definitely was a, it would get under my skin a lot more but uh, there, uh, there are just so many more imp important things to get upset about <laughs> you know right. like people say rude things online all the time that are like, meant to be hurtful get upset about that don't get upset about somebody sort of just characterizing you as as what you are yeah well, that's yeah, fair enough fair enough well, I started playing guitar and I'm not very good at it, but I started playing guitar back in like the early 90s, which is kind of like the tail end of sort of the OG shred era with Ingwe and George Lynch and all that when guitar was really cool. And just like it was like, I don't know, I felt like that was probably the peak of guitar until recently where I feel like 
the state of metal guitar now kind of reminds me of that era again. You've got your people like Tim Henson and Tosin and, you know, that whole generation who have made it cool in a way that it wasn't for a long time. What's your take on that and where the guitar scene is now? I think this is the coolest time to be a guitar player that I have experienced in my guitar career. Like, you know, I was not around for, you know, the, the glory days of the 80s shredding, you know. So for me now, you know, I started playing guitar in the 2000s and, you know, now in 2023, this is the coolest time. Guitar has never been cooler and mm -hmm. there has not been more innovation happening, you know, the Polyphia guys, Jason Richardson, uh, Pliny, yeah. Tosin, like these incredible new generation of guitar players, you know, Yvette Young with this mm -hmm. wild two-hand technique that she's doing, like, you know, it's it's just such an exciting time to play guitar right now. Like, and I get excited looking at other people doing stuff, you know, like, and, and Josh will look at these guitar players and he's like, why don't you do anything like that? I'm like, I don't know. I got to learn. Like, <laughs> I can't. You know, there's like, I got I to gotta keep up with the, yeah, with the it's kids wild. now, you know. It's, it's, it's wild and There's so people, inspiring. Yeah. I mean, like talk about like Jason, for example, like if you asked me 15 years ago, I wouldn't have thought it was humanly possible to do what he does. I don't know if it's humanly possible now, to be honest with you. <laughs> like, and, uh, and, you know, I, uh, I got a chance to play with the Polyphia guys with Tim and Scott once okay. uh, at NAM. We did uh, an event for the Steve Vai Pia launch for his new signature guitar. And this jam that I'm going to set up was myself, Scott and Tim, Steve Vai, Joe Satriani, Paul Gilbert. No pressure. And the three of us were like, what the fuck are we even doing here? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I was like, oh, my God, like. And that was where you really saw the old guard and the new guard yeah. like come together in, in a really harmonious, wonderful way. Like we, we're standing around on stage playing My Guitar Wants to Kill Your Mama at the House of Blues in Anaheim with like all these industry people are there. And like we're all getting to do our own thing. You know, the the Polyphia guys were doing their shreddy stuff. Like I was doing my stuff. Steve and, and like the way that they said it too is so casual. It's like it's gonna be you and you know the guys and the so probably Joe and Paul and of uh -huh. course Steve and I was like oh yeah Steve and Joe and Paul <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and, and Tim and Scott like right. you know I'm like no big deal. Um, but you know that was a situation where the old guard could have come in and, and hazed the new kids. You know like they are the jam gods. They can play circles around anything that we you know us youngins yeah. would be doing in there and like. They were so gracious and they traded solos with us so effortlessly. Like they listened to what we were doing and call and response back to us. And like, that's, that's what it's all about. There's like this beautiful mutual respect in the guitar yeah. community between all the different styles. And the only people arguing about it are in the comment section. Yeah. That's it. We're not the doing artists it themselves are not like that. Yes. Which is cool to see because I mean, as much as, you know, the younger generation are definitely pushing things forward in a technical level. I think that the older people have something to add in terms of, I guess, just like musicality, I guess I would say, um, you know, that, you know, they've got a sense of like melody and sort of maybe a little bit more restraint and stuff that I, I think is important as well. So, you know, I don't think one is better than the other. I think it's just, you know, like you said, learning and, and, and growing, you know, between generations. Exactly. And, you know, like, I love that Satriani is putting out Satriani music, you know, he's mm -hmm. not going like, oh, I, I better, I better do what's trendy now, you know, do right. this sort of like lo-fi beat mixed with you, like, Joe right. Satriani is still putting out amazing Joe Satriani music, and Steve Vai is still putting out amazing Steve Vai music, and like, everybody is coexisting and moving forward together in the perfect harmonious way. And I think that is so healthy, that nobody's competing with anybody, everybody's just you know, a rising tide lifts all boats and we're all just rising the guitar community together. And I think, you know, like you said before, it being a better time than ever to be a guitarist, I think it's easier. It's still not easy, but it's easier, I think, to make a living as a guitarist now than ever. Like you can make a great living without even leaving your house now as a guitarist. Oh, yeah. I have a, a singer on this tour for the first time. Uh, her name is Casey Carlson. And she makes her, she made her name on TikTok and she gets, you know, endorsements and, you know, I'm not really sure how the business side of what she does works, but like, I know she makes a very nice living doing TikTok, you know, mm -hmm. and I don't even know how my TikTok is like, you know, 10 low calorie drinks to order when you order your coffee, <laughs> you know, whatever, like, mine is not even music stuff at all, but like, 
you know, this, this generation has it figured out where you can, you don't even, like you said, you don't even have to leave the house to be a professional musician anymore. Yeah. Which I think is awesome. I mean, I know there's some people who are, you know, I guess I would just say a little bit butthurt about that. Some of the older guard and, and I understand that, but you know, I think it's a much smarter attitude to like say, well, what can I learn from that than be angry that someone else figured out something that you didn't. A hundred percent. I couldn't agree with you more. Um, I think that anybody that gets butthurt about the way someone else is having success in their career uh, is just mad that they didn't think about it first. Yeah. Um, well, on, on that note, you know, you've done so much to kind of build your brand and uh, it's not all social media, but I think that is a big part of the job now. And I feel like there's a lot of people I hear from musicians that are sort of frustrated about that aspect of it, that they kind of, they just want to play guitar. They don't want to be a content creator, but I feel like that's just kind of what the job is now. Uh, what do you think about that? It is. It is a necessary evil. Um, I'm not the best at it. I'm not the worst at it. Um, you know, at some point, I think I will have to get a, a good setup to like do playthrough videos and stuff at home because I like when I do stuff like that, I just set my cell phone up like we're talking right now and, you know, we'll play and it sounds like shit. So like, that's that's the kind of thing, you know, I, I have to evolve a bit in that way myself. Um, we were just having this discussion on the tour bus a couple of days ago where uh, my front of house engineer said, you know, I could delete my Facebook tomorrow and my life wouldn't change at all. And I was like, if I deleted my Facebook tomorrow, all of my Facebook ads promoting this tour would go away. You know, right. like, and nobody these would are like, go. just like, yeah. and people wouldn't go, you know, I'm, I'm playing a show in Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania today. I'm from California. Why should any, you know, how would anybody in Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania right. know that I was here without social media? Like, this is the way that people find out about things in this day and age. So I think it's important to not be too stubborn about it and to embrace the tools you know, that's like saying, I'm not going to read Guitar Tab because back in my day, we had to slow the vinyl down on the needle to right. get over and over again to learn the part. No, look at the fucking tab. You know, like, right. Why utilize you the resources that you have now because they're here, you know? Well, you have a manager now, obviously, that helps you and all that. So you've had other managers, but you didn't always have those people. So what advice would you have for someone who has maybe some small following, but doesn't have a team and they want to create opportunities for themselves? Like, where, where do you start? So I will give you a, a bit of an unpopular opinion about this because I, I make my, my living in the live arena. Like I, the way I make my living is being on tour. And I think that while the social media thing is amazing and I think everybody should take advantage of it, do, you know, put up good content, good posts, reels, YouTube, all this, all that stuff. I also think it doesn't, take the place of performing live. If you want to, if that's your ultimate goal to mm -hmm. be in a big band and be on tour, you have to get experience going out there and playing guitar in front of people. That is the key. You have to get a lot of experience. You have to make mistakes. You have to, you know, step on something and pull your cable out to know that next time you have to loop your cable through your strap. You know, you have to, you have right. to make mistakes in order to learn how to fix them later. So when the big call comes, it's not your first rodeo. You're not like, wow, I've never even played a show before. And now I have an opportunity to play these big stages. When that call comes, you want to be as seasoned and as experienced as you possibly can. So go and play your instrument in front of people, whether that means a cover band, whether that means an open mic, you know, VFW halls, like I have done it all like multiple times over, you know, playing in other people's bands that might not necessarily be your perfect style of music, but gets you, you know, a little further to where you want to go. Um, there are just so many ways to just get out there and hone your craft, fine tune what you do. So when bigger opportunities come, then you're ready for them. It's playing guitar by yourself in your room, playing guitar in front of other people and playing guitar in the studio are three different things. Yes. I remember the first time I was recorded and listened to by an actual like good producer I thought I was a decent guitarist until I tried doubling myself to a click and I was like, oh my God, I suck. <laughs> yeah, the click is a beast. I personally, I like, I embrace the suck with the click. Like I, I lean into it. It's like, it's like this weird, like Chinese water torture addiction. Like, you know, if I'm recording, like I lay down, I lay my head down on my pillow at night and I just feel like beep, 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 <laughs> right? beep. You know, like I have it loud in my ears on stage. I have it loud. Uh, you know, we use it in my solo band. Uh, we don't use it in the Alice show. We we had it on the Demi show. Like, 
And I just like, I, I like it. It's it's bored into my fiber of my, my soul now, <laughs> the, the click sound. Um, so that is something I think for young guitar players, that's super, super important because it's the way things are now. A lot of stuff yeah. is time coded. A lot of stuff is to a click. Practice at home to a click. You know, get yourself a good metronome with a sound that's not too annoying. Uh, mine is a Dr. Beat. I use a drum metronome. Um, or even there's a, a metronome I have one on my phone called Pro Metronome. It's two dollars, you know. And then you have just a metronome to use all the time. You have that consistency, and it will serve you so well in the long run if you're just used to it already and don't have to get used to it, you know, when the red light is on in your recording. I think recording yourself is a really good experience too because it will shine a spotlight on a lot of little details <laughs> that you. It's impossible to notice those things in the moment absolutely you're absolutely right recording yourself and watching back uh and same thing with live shows you know watching your live shows back and seeing like hey that worked hey that really didn't work <laughs> like let's you know more of this less of that you know um all feedback is good feedback like, you seem you know, like especially somebody, when you sell feedback you seem like somebody who's not afraid to um be hard on yourself without you know, you, 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 you don't beat yourself up, but you seem like you're tough on yourself. How do you think about that? I am. And I do beat myself up actually. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I have different levels of confidence in myself. Um, when I'm on stage, there's nobody more confident than me. And when I'm off stage, there's nobody more anxious than me. <laughs> um, but, uh, I think if you're not hard on yourself, I other people, other people are always going to be hard on you, I yeah. think. So the way to get ahead of that is to be hard on yourself. And if someone, if someone is hard on you, they're not telling you anything you don't know. Yeah. You know, and I think that's, that's a big part of the social media stuff. You know, I try not to read a lot of comments anymore because that kind of feedback, whether it's good or bad, it will sort of get in your head. You know, if someone's like, oh my, you know, too many people, you know, a lot of people talk about the, uh, the negative comments that you get on social media, you know, you suck and this you know this and that you know hope you go die in a fire and yeah. get raped by third string rams players which is one that somebody <laughs> said to me recently um, but oh, not a lot lovely. of people talk about the <laughs> charming you know yeah. um not a lot of people talk about the pitfalls of reading the good comments because you know all of a sudden you read all these good comments you're a goddess you're incredible this is the most amazing show i've ever seen you know like and you're like i am incredible I'm the best, <laughs> you know, like, and then you get a big head and you're not too hard on yourself and you start making mistakes. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important. Like if you're going to take the feedback, take the good with the bad, you know, with a grain of salt and keep your head on straight about what is actually going on and when you need to self edit. Right. Cool. Well, uh, that sounds like a good note to end it on to me. Uh, anything else you want to plug or mention or words of wisdom before I let you go? Just how excited I am for the new record. Uh, Call of the Void comes out July 7th. Uh, this has truly been a labor of love, and I'm very, very excited to get it out to the world and let you guys all listen to it.